uh, first, you know, just say uh, thank you, Plaza Kamati, um, to Maestro Akashe, uh, to Teacher Akashe for being here. Um, and want to thank uh, Brindis and Jamie uh, who have uh, helped me make this uh, symposium and this uh, set of events possible. Also, Niv here, our student researcher, one of our student researchers who has supported us through uh, um, the development of the symposium. The symposium is focusing on the communal flower. As you know, the communal flower um, is a way of living by different indigenous peoples in what we now call Mexico. Um, and it comes out of the, the corn, the path of the corn. Corn is our really, the, our sustenance, our mother really, a corn is where we come from. We are people of the corn. Um, and it focuses on communal responsibility and it also focuses on assembly, which are uh, two, two of the pillars of the communal flower. The symposium is also a folk, has an, a focus and an emphasis on water the importance of water in our lives. Um, and so, you know, the person that will really be illuminating this, bringing light to this is Maestro Akashe. Um, but I will say just one little note um, that uh, in Mexico, we often hear abuelitas say, um, eh, contigo todo sin ti nada, which means with you, everything without you, nothing. Water is alive, water is living, um, and water is inside of us. We are water. We are water transforming. We are part of that transformation. Um, it's a great responsibility to be water. So um, I hope that the lessons shared here today help you. Um, I do wanna just make a, a, a little comment here. Um, and I just want to uh, first uh, just acknowledge uh, the land that I'm situated in. So I want to thank uh, the earth for allowing us to be here breathing together. Um, I want to acknowledge everything that had to happen for us to be here and, and want to thank uh, my ancestors um, and just thank this moment uh, this here and now. I also want to thank the original peoples of this land, the Ohlone people, uh, their ancestors, uh, including the Chochenyu and Karkin, and what is called Huchin, also known as Oakland, the Reymatush in Yelamu, where uh, the campus is situated as well, and in, in also called San Francisco, the Yokuts in the South Bay, uh, and the Muwekma, uh, who have been throughout the lands in this unceded territory for, uh, for generations, caring for the bay, uh, caring for the forest, the winds, the animals, without the work that they did for thousands of years, that their ancestors did for thousands of years, we would not be able to enjoy the life that we have here. Um, likewise, I also want to invite you to recognize and support indigenous peoples, pueblos originarios in the territories where you live, so if you want to share where you're uh, coming from now, thank you. I see some comments there. Thank you for activating the chat. And I also want to make a note and, 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 and say that indigenous peoples um, take care and sustain 80% of biodiversity in this planet. Uh, and despite this immense labor, um, they are consistently threatened by a government and corporations for this labor to defend water, to defend the earth and life itself. Um, I wanna also make a note uh, to please support indigenous communities in the regions that you're coming from. For the region that we're in, I wanna invite the school CCA administrators to pay Shumi tax to the Ohlone people um, and to pay uh, uh, to pay also the Ray Matush people. Uh, the links will be shared on the chat in a minute. Um, and to share your abundance uh, in whichever way you can, uh, sometimes just by showing up and amplifying the land back movement that is going on that has been going on for the last 530 years. Uh, so um, I want to pass now the mic to Maestro Akashe. Um, and I just want to say again, Claso Kamati Maestro, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to the space. Claso um, Kamati. Thank you very much for such important announcement. 
And thank you also for inviting me and considering me for this symposium. I am really glad to be here. And let's get started. So we have um, not as much as as much time as I usually take. So for people that is joining from classes in, in Machia Toltecat or in, in our Mighty Networks, you know how <laughs> the classes go. So if, if you haven't joined, um, of course you're invited, but they usually go for a couple of hours. But so let's start with this uh, little lecture that we put together where we will be explaining not only three aspects of ancestral meaning given to water as transparency, adaptability, and nourishment, but also we will tap a little bit into the history of the so-called Tolteca and Tum Sabi nations. So let's start with Tolteca. We hear this term a lot, and if you are interested in any kind of indigenous, um, central, uh, from an Awak, knowledge or information, you have heard this plenty of times. But most of the times, Tolteca is being attributed to just a movement right now. Same thing as Mexica, right? So you hear a lot of Mexica Danzante or Danzante Mexica or, or the Mexica community or Mexica person. However, uh, what we know is, and what is the fact of it, is that neither Tolteca nor Mexica nations survived as nations. Uh, they were unfortunately, specifically speaking about the so-called Mexica, which is known, it was known as Tenochka, uh, they were exterminated for the most part. Now, what happened to the Tolteca? So first, let's see what Tolteca means, so that you also have a little bit more of, of, of info about that. So Tolteca, it's translated as the carriers of the tuli, which is a plant uh, that you see here in this uh, fragment from the analysis of um, Culhuacan, I think, or is, is this a, yeah, I think so. And then, or also can be referred to the people that live near where the tuli grows or where the tuli grows. And from appearance, we can say that, well, there were many nations that developed nearby lakes and nearby formations where these plant grows. However, there is something very special about this specific group known as Tolteca which for many experts or for many academics, it's still an enigma. So what we can see here in this fragment, this is a post-Hispanic document. And because of that, you can see the, the style is not necessarily very polished. It's, it's a little bit uh, neglected. And what you can see is that there is these two main leaders. There were these two main leaders of the so-called Tolteca Chichimeca nation. And here we add another name, right? Chichimeca. The way in which we know there were also Chichimeca is because of the clothing they wear. So most of the Tolteca uh, documents displaced Tolteca people wearing cotton textile clothes. While in other hand, the so-called Chichimeca, or in this case, more specifically speaking about the Teo Chichimeca nations, they never wore textiles. They only wore um, the hives and the skins of animals that they hunted. So they were very different, both of them, in the way in which they ruled themselves. But at some point, what we know, and is still uh, not necessarily very precise, is that they met. So let's look into the environment in which they both started to meet. As you know, this is the scientific name of the plant called Tuli, which is where Tolteca name comes from. And it is a plant that it grows near big concentration of waters. So for you to have Tuli, you need to have a healthy and luscious river or also pond or even sometimes a spring of water, a lake. But most of the times is where water is just abundantly gathered. So these obviously uh, help them not only to gather the main material for their survival, as you can see, since tule is utilized to make from carpets, rugs, even instruments of like cooking, baskets, uh, house, houses, and also canoes made out of only exclusively about this, this material. Well, also, 
it is known that they started to depend a lot of the bodies of water. So this communion between the plant called Thule and the water helped them to start learning from both, from vegetation, from the fauna, and from the bodies of water themselves. And because of that, the, the philosophy they carry was heavily focused in these three uh, aspects in the, in the animals that live nearby, the plants that were there, and the water themselves. So, and because of that, most of their uh, words even also had a strong influence of all of this philosophy. Um, in opposition, the, the, the Teochichimeca were more nomadic. And because of that, they never really um, settle for a long period of time. It is also known that they didn't really build anything. So they would favor to live in caves. However, as we also know from some chronicles like the Florentine Codex, their society was highly developed in terms of politics and social uh, norms. So they were uh, very peaceful for most part. They didn't really enter into many battles, specifically speaking about the Teochichimecas. There is different, uh, um, let's say, branches of the Chichimeca nations. So they met at some point, and the Tolteca spoke a very ancient way of Nahuatl, that we now is one, it's still one of the most spoken uh, native languages in Mexico. And the, the Chichimecas spoke Chichimeca, which there is no registers of. So apparently Chichimeca and Nahuatl somehow fusioned and Chichimeca disappeared in, in that process. So we don't really have a certain translation of what Chichimeca means because it was um, made in their own language. However, in this fusion, the new nation known as Tolteca Chichimeca was born. And this is very important because most of the so-called Nahua nations come from that original nation. So in Nahuatl, right, we were speaking about the, the whole language that the Tolteca spoke. So Nahuatl, it's a name given from people that doesn't really speak Nahuatl to the language itself. In Nahuatl, we don't really call Nahuatl our language. We call it Masewatlachtoli or Teopantlachtoli or Wewetlachtoli, depending in which tone we're speaking it. Uh, but Nahuatl translated signifies harmony. And because of that, Nahuatl is the language of harmony or harmonious language. One of the most important rules for the language in which you can many times do some sort of um, uh, exceptions uh, at the moment of creating words is that it needs to be harmonious to pronounce. Um, so in Nahuatl, there is this word called town or village. And that word is altepet. And as you can see, the structure of, of altepet speaks about what we were speaking before, the ways in which they gather and the places they favor to settle and to, well, have their little villages or towns. So altepet comes from two words, which is ad, meaning water, and tepet, which is a mountain or a mount. So what they would say is that in between the mountain and the river is the perfect way to place and to live your life. And because of that, in now what, whenever you speak, even if it's Mexico City, which is a huge city, you will have to say, Puey Altepet, which is a big village, right? Big town. Or if it's just a regular city, you just say Altepet. So the word hasn't really changed. And the structure is still speaking about water and mountains. So what we can see here is the, the glyph that is given to this specific word. And this is another part about Nahuatl, that some of the nations read, wrote this language in what we know as phonograms. So a phonogram is a system in which each one of the symbols needs to be pronounced in combination to make one word. So when you pronounce them, you actually have this meaning. So you have on top, the symbol of water, at, and then underneath the symbol of the mountain, Altepet. And because of that, whenever you read these from top to, to bottom, you say Altepet. So this means village. Um, as you can see, all of these fragments that you will see next are taken from a document known as Mendocino Codex. And in Mendocino Codex, there is a huge amount of many villages. Not all of them have to be or have to do anything with, um, or, uh, with water. 
but most of them do. And what this means is that this was still a tradition. Like people will still look for bodies of water to be nearby the villages. So each one of these places that you can see is the name of a village in which water can be abundant. For example, here in this place, you see teeth, which it speaks of abundance of something. And then you see that it's inside water. So it's a place that has, I don't know, probably had a huge lake or many rivers. This is water that is not so drinkable. And because of that, it might be a little bit more like wastewater. Water that it runs under a path, a, a place in which water comes from the inside. Even it's given to a nation called a Colhua. And then you see other places in which, for, for example, here is speaking about spring of water, Ameyalco. Here, water that runs underneath earth, so subterranean, uh, 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 or how would you say, un, un, under earth rivers, and so on. So as you can see, these uh, nations develop mainly because of the way in which they gather information from their surroundings, specifically water. And that's why we can comfortably say that the Tolteca Chichimeca and most of the Nahua nations were water nations. They not only look for water to survive, but they also had a very developed knowledge of how water runs and what that implies for them and for their own environment. So they knew how to work with water in so many different levels, from uh, gathering it to make their own aquaponic systems, as known in Mexico Tenochtitlan, which is the so-called nowadays Mexico City, as chinampas, where they will harvest, they will plant, and they will do any kind of, or most kinds of vegetables, they will plant and harvest and flowers, um, always connected to the water, right? So the they didn't really require much land, but most of the time they just grew their food with water. And now obviously aquaponics is like a very fancy word, right? Everybody's using it. Oh, development. Japanese is doing that. Well, um, in, in these uh, ancient societies, it was done in the 12th century probably. They started to do this. And then from that moment on, it also became a technology. It's also known that they would uh, have their own fish and their own aquatic, let's say, some type of shrimps, asholots, and other things they will eat, uh, gather nearby the chinampa. So they didn't really uh, have to depend on the river, but they learned how to do that in smaller portions. Another interesting part about the way in which they treated water is that in Mexico Tenochtitlan, again, now, now known as Mexico City, uh, it's one of the places in the world that developed the first a, um, how do you call it? a sewer system uh, in the history of civilizations. This was developed by this great leader and architect from Texcoco region known as Nezahualcoyot. You have heard of that name plenty of times probably. So he developed this sewer system in which uh, they will gather, they will bring water from a river that was far, like 20 kilometers far from Mexico City because the water around Mexico City in this part of the lake was not sweet water, was not fresh water, was half salty water. And because of that, it was not usable for consumption. So they will gather the water with something that they call aqueduct uh, without the need of any kind of pump or any kind of mechanic uh, force, but just by the gravity and the constant inclination of that construction. And then the most interesting part is that they will filter it back to the river. So in this sewer system, they have found some little offerings remaining there of the so-called force known as Laloc or Chalchut liquid, as little uh, offerings of thanks for that water that was given and then returned it again clean. The process uh, in which they filtered was a bio-activated um, process. So bacteria and certain kind of animals that are on the bottom of the lake were used to filter this water. And because of that, we can say that a lot of what we learn from our masters and also from my place of origin, since I'm half Nahua and half Mixteca, is coming from the Tolteca Chichimeca nations. Now let's go into the Tunsabi. 
and Tunsabi is the name given in Mixteca language to Mixtecat. Mixtecat is a is a Nahuatl name, so it's a name that it was given by the Nahuatl speakers to these uh, people, but they didn't speak Nahuatl. They speak, they spoke and speak still <laughs> Tunsabi, which is Mixtecat. So uh, Tunsabi and Mixtecat both represents that they are the people from the clouds, and sometimes they also translate as the people from the rain. You can see here, this is a little fragment of a Mixteca document known as the Codex Vindobonensis, in which there is a person representing Heka Quetzalcoatl, the force that nourishes living beings and also communicates, holding um, responsibility of studying through six years of Venus, the behavior of water. So where is this Mixteca region? Here we can see the state known as Oaxaca in Mexico. And as you can see, Oaxaca is one of the most rich in condensed of tradition states in the whole country. It is many countries in one. And if you ever plan to go to Mexico, one of the first places you have to go is Oaxaca. So forget about Cancun, Oaxaca. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, uh, because you will find really a lot of the essence of Mexico, of, of a, a lot of that part. So, and here what you can see is that most of Oaxaca is mountains and so-called sierra. Uh, there is a lot of rivers, there is a lot of concentrations of water as well, but it's a semi-desertic area for most part. Another interesting part about Oaxaca or uh, many of these po uh, populations is that it's a very elevated area, and because of that, many of these villages live really close to what they call the clouds. And because of that, it, the name was very accurate, giving it the name of the people that is really close to the clouds or people of the clouds. So what most of the time is spoken about them is that they had a really advanced knowledge about the rains and the pluvial, pluvial movements. So this allowed them to be masters at knowing when exactly to plant and when exactly to harvest. Also, one of the interesting parts that, um, that is, uh, comes with this whole knowledge is that they apparently were able to know so much about the rain and the way in which the clouds move that they were able to attract them, to pull them or to push them away, depending on the region in which they needed uh, with rain or no rain at that point. So a lot of these uh, people were known as graniceros or hail, I don't know, hail people, hail masters, <laughs> we can translate, we can give a raw translation to that. Um, so it's very interesting to see these because what that entails is that they didn't know, they, they did not only depended on the atmospheric uh, circumstances of the place, but they also learn how to have an influence on them. Similar to the Tenochka with the river, but in this case with the rain. Now, because of that, many times they say that they have these rituals in which they worship the rains and they have all of these so-called gods that are supposed to be the guardians of the rains and this and that. And, and you know, how um, uh, Western academia translates everything as a, as a cult and as a worship. Uh, I, I, I think they, none of these academic people ever give or do something nice to their parents that has given them everything. Because I guess that also qualifies for worship, right? If you're giving things or you giving something in return. But that's exactly the point of this little pun, that there is a big difference between being respectful, being grateful to something that has constantly nourished you, nourished your grandparents, and nourished your kids, and worship it. So what you can see in all of these fragments of the same document, Codex Pindobonensis, are some of the ways in which they uh, um, honor respectfully the way in water was gathered. So you can see here uh, this same person that we saw at the beginning, this same um, expert of, of the wind and the Quetzalcoatl, giving an offering of copali and branches to the, to the little lake that is here. It's like a pond. You can also see how strong meetings were held in the same places 
So what this means is that water was not only a place in which they will gather the resources to work, but they will also gather to decide on things, to dialogue, to have conversations nearby the river, because they also knew that the essence of the river, that the constant movement and everything that that, uh, that the reaction in their environment will start is perfect for your thoughts to flow constantly, for speaking, for dialoguing. So there is also work with water, as you can see. And obviously, I can't spend uh, as much time as I would like in each one of these portions. More offerings, in this case, is offering of uh, Malinali and offering of earth. And then there is some ritual, uh, nocturnal ba bathing, which you see here, uh, recycling of water, offering of chants for water, and just uh, the different knowledge of water being calm and being strong at the same time. So streams of water were a, a huge subject in all of these documents. If you have the chance, uh, try to get a hold of Bindogonensis. So it's also called Vienna Codex, and you will see how many uh, representations of water they are. So because of that, we can say that they did not only honor and respected the water as, as um, a nation that was now characterized as animist, but also they took it to a science, to a scientific point in which they learned how to work with the element, their effects, in not only the way in which the water is, but how do you behave when you are nearby the water and what is the good for you only to have water flowing nearby you. So now let's enter into the subject. After this little introduction, we can speak of the first quality, which is the transparency. This little uh, part we have called it Atlamachtlachtoa, which translates as the wise word of water in Nahuatl language. When we are little, there is um, different things that our teachers and and our masters and parents teaches us and guides us into. But according to this document known as the Mendocino Codex, which is a Nahua document, at four, age, at four years of age, a kid was started to give in the teachings of water. And in a very interesting way, uh, my father in the path known as Maestro Arturo Mesa Gutierrez uh, shared that Unfortunately, he didn't really get to, to live that experience, but his older brothers did. He was, I think he was one of the last of 11 kids. And because of that, well, there was a huge gap in the, in the age. So his grandfather would peak at specific uh, years of age, a little bit older, as he says, <clears throat> than four years old. He will pick one of these uh, brothers or sisters. And then he will give them a little vessel, a bowl with water. And he will tell them, it's time for you to learn from the water. You have to sit here. And he will sit them there the whole entire night and say, I'll come back in the morning and you will tell me what did you learn. And they will do any, they would have not to do anything than just look at the water and appreciate it and try to learn from the water. So after that night, he will come back and he will ask them, what did the water tell you? What did the water teach you? And then they will start to speak. Well, it taught me to be this, to be like that. Da, da, da. So this is, this is a beautiful confirmation of what we see in this document because what we see is here the father giving wise word, right? Settled, grounded. It's not scolding, right? A grounded, guiding word to the little kid that is already holding this bowl with water. So apparently in ancient times, this started at, at four years of age. What we know also from my father is that there were some advices that were given and they are closely connected to the water. The first one, he translates as whatever you do, whatever you do, try to be complete but transparent. Let the light pass through you so that they know the intentions of your ideas and your actions. Your thoughts and works should not be leaky and incomplete. So this could be read as Yes, Analtona, Shisia Kin Asi. 
inik i itas, eh mo techna, yese intech ichti koyon ke amo. So, what this will, this is the translation in the sense, right? It's not a literal translation, but it's the sense of the translation. The literal translation is, is, is a little bit more objective, right? It doesn't really explain so much uh, all of these little details. It just says, whenever you do something, be complete, but it also be transparent. Allow the light to transcend, to penetrate through your actions um, so that people look through that and not through your holes. So this what this uh, starts to explain at apparently very young age is for people to not have hidden agendas, objectives, and interests, for them to speak and act in a transparent way to from the very beginning let people know why you are here and what you intend to do, what you intend to take out of all of this. And most of the times uh, in Mexico, especially in Mexico, which is one of the most corrupt countries uh, as of now, this has been lost. This advice has just long been forgotten. And there is other things being replaced it with, which is one of them, if you speak Spanish, known as el que no atranza no avanza which is a terrible way to, to, to speak about life and to think about life. If you don't do, uh, how do you say, if you don't um, cheat, if you don't cheat it? yeah, thank you. If you don't cheat, you can advance. That's what it's, it's translated as. So you can see how uh, opposite, how dramatically extreme this switch of, of the way of thinking was. So in ancient times, it was not the mentality as you can see in, Unfortunately, most of Mexican people nowadays, but it was this more cleanliness of the word and more cleanliness of the actions that uh, put these societies together and kept them together. It was not convenience. It was that you could trust and depend on people without the fear of like, oh, what is this person going to ask me in return, right? If I, if he's doing this for me or if he's doing this for, um, you know, doing this nice thing for another person, right? Now, another one which is translated as, you must be like the water. Come when circumstances warrant it, or act with the force of a torrent when necessary. You can read this as, which is um, like, you should be like the, like the water. It's, it's not like, if you like, you know, be maybe like the water. No, it's like, you should be like the water. Be like the water. Um, be calm, but also be strong, right? Uh, like really not intimidated, but you wouldn't dare to just jump into a river that you see that is very strong, right? You will be very careful. It's not that the river wants to intimidate you or wants to scare you. It's that it has its own force and you have to respect the force of the river. So imagine a person's character being like that. Imagine a person's character, and I'm speaking about character, not about temperament. Our temperament can be always explosive if you want, always fire if you want, but your character is what shields your temperament to just potentially get out of uh, control. So I believe most people has a strong temperament, but you have to shape your character like water. Know how to be very calm, but when it's needed, okay, not only marking your line, but actually be a river that you will leave the message clear. You don't want to step in this river because you will be taken away. So, but this is like the water teaches you. <clears throat> Sorry. Next is the adaptability. So, in this, we have called this little module a pescat which translates as the water mirror. Here there is different representations of water as a symbol, and um, this has been taken from different documents. Um, this is, this too has been taken from Borgia Codex, this has been taken from Bobonico Codex, this has been taken from Laud Codex, and this, I believe, is been taken from Cospi Codex. <clears throat> now, what you can see in the representations of water on top the three representations of water on top are some, somewhat different. Um, and what you can see in the middle one is that there is something that looks like an eye. 
in the water. This is a common representation of water as, as a symbol of the 20 potentials in the calendaric system. So this is a representation of an eye, but it's an eye that has no eyelid. So it's just an eye. Is that because they give a face to the, to the water? Not really. What you see here is other representations of the same kind of eyes. And in this case, you see the representation of the sun. And around that, there is the nocturnal sky. And you can see those eyes being around. What that represents is the night and the stars. Here you can also see a different representation. This is taken from uh, Feyerbari Mayer Codex. And in this one, you see that in the chest plate, it holds the symbol that we were talking previously in the Tun Sabi module as Venus. So this is a representation of Venus as a morning, and especially this one as a morning star, but sometimes it's also represented as an evening star. So, and you can also see the eye, and then there's some elongated eyes on the sides too. Here you can see in the Mendocino Codex, another representation. In this case, this is a, again a phonogram, right? And in the phonogram, the first part means Il Huica. And the arrow penetrating is hunting, right? Or like uh, piercing with an with a arrow, which is mina. So both means il huica mina. So il huica mina was the name given to one of the leaders, the ancient leaders of the Nochka people known as Motecuzoma. So there were two Motecuzomas. Motecuzoma Shokoyotzin was alive when the invaders uh, arrived. And then Motecuzoma il huica mina was alive generations before. So what this means is that this represents a person that studies the sky as, as precise as if we will be shooting arrows on those stars. And here you can see the same document, Codice Mendocino, a person that is actually doing that, studying the nocturnal sky. And you can see there the night and all of the little stars as eyes. Here another one, representation from mm, Laur Codex. And in this one is a nocturnal sky in which underneath is the representation of where we are at, which is the Tlachli Ikbak or the Tlaltikbak, the earth. So we can comfortably say that the water here does not have an eye, but is reflecting a star. And this helps us to understand these other representations and the picture, just to give it more context, which is that the first ways in which um, uh, stellar astronomic maps were drawn was when they were projected or reflected on these water mirrors. So you can see many of these in some higher mountains still, or even in some places where there is archaeological um, still um, constructions. This one is at the top of Machu Picchu in Peru. So what you can see here is that when water is placed, it stays completely still. Now imagine a place that does not have light pollution at night. What will you see there? Now imagine a place in which this can be uh, uh, placed, uh, this can be um, expanded, and not only expanded, but it can have different markers around. So you, you can draw with little pieces of yarn the trajectory of stars that you are measuring. Because of that, the water in its adaptability also work as the first method of studying the nocturnal sky for these nations. So this is one of our most probably um, attributed factor of the symbol of Ad. This is also given to the qualities of the people that is born in this symbol. So they say that people that is born within the symbol of Ad, uh, whether it is in the day, in the hour, or in the ritual month, my hold the capabilities of being adaptable and here what we can say about that is that adaptability and change can be two different things most of the times whenever we speak about adaptability we think that uh, we need just to change ourselves right and let's say here in the united states i see a lot of assimilation and cultural assimilation and people thinking that well that's adaptable not really because you're giving up a lot of the essence of what you are. Adaptable is, as our masters will explain it to us, imagine you have a bottle of Coca-Cola that is empty and is clean, right? And then in the other hand, you have a vessel of water. Now, if you pour 
that clean, beautiful water in the bottle of Coca-Cola, which is a metaphor for this modern society, no matter how long you will leave it there, the water will not turn into Coca-Cola. So the circumstance is shaping the water as Coca-Cola, but the water never changes into a Coca-Cola. So mo no matter if the circumstances shapes the appearance of where you are, your essence remains water. And because of that, it's very important to know the essence of who you are, not necessarily the dressing code. That's not the essence. That's just the appearance, right? Even the language, it's also the appearance, right? So there is a lot of people that speak Spanish and they feel very strongly about their nation, about being Mexican. And Spanish is not even our native name, you know? So if you don't speak Spanish, no big deal. Uh, if you don't speak Nahuatl, no big deal. What is important here? The advices, the way of thinking, the concepts, the essence that made those nations great. Not the way in which they dress or the way in which they call themselves or the way in which they spoke. That's just the vessel. The essence is what we need to recover and to maintain clean. Now. Oh, we're doing good time. We're going to have time for questions. That's good. Nourishment as the last quality. So we call this little part Yolis Inan. Yolilis, sorry, Yolilis Inan, which is the mother of all life or the mother of the, the mother of everything that will be alive ever. Here we see um, a beautiful representation taken from the Borgia Codex. And in this one, we see something called La Sorteo Meyawal at La Cuelle, because it's all of them. So at La Cuelle is another name given to one of the most, um, let's say, uh, spoken concepts of water, which is the concept of Chalchutlique. Here we can see a representation of the book of Chalchutlique. And what we can say about this is that Chalchutlique is a complex word. It comes from these three roots. The first one being Chalchihuit. Chalchihuit means the jade stone, but it's also um, used as an expression of beauty. In this case, it's used as an expression of something precious. And I will explain wh what I mean with that. Then Tli, which is a possessive noun, it makes whatever is in the first part hers, his, its. And then Cuelle, which is Cuelle, Cuelle, or Cuetlat are three different ways of uh, saying the same word, which is a skirt. Because of that, Chalchutlique as a whole means her precious skirt. But it doesn't really specify of whom. So the precious skirt and many times is used with the word tonantzin or tonanan. So tonanan chalchutlique or tonantzin chalchutlique many times is when all of these different words uh, that you will hear many times like cuatlique, chalchutlique, sitlalinique, etc., etc. You will hear tonanan or tonantzin cuatlique, tonantzin chalchutlique, tonantzin sitlalinique. It doesn't mean that it's the earth in all, in all different um, expressions, but there is different skirts that our mother earth wears. In this case, it's the skirt that covers it uh, with colors, like if they will be precious stones like jade stones or even turquoise stones. So what that means is that whenever you want to identify in documents the concept of chalchut liquid, you will look for these different elements. One of them is the nose are, uh, attire. So this nose ornament, most of the time, is made out of turquoise stone. Sometimes has this shape like a butterfly, and sometimes has the shape of an upside down, um, kind of like a pyramid, just to, to simplify it. And, and another one important is jade stones on the skirt. So if you find jade stones on the skirt, which is a lot of, a lot of the time is like this pattern or like this other pattern that is right above the white uh, uh, edge. That is also the pattern of precious stone. That by itself would mean chalchut liquid, which is a skirt of precious stones. But guess what? Chalchut liquid most of the time is uh, attributed to the water, right? And it's like, oh, it's the goddess of the water again, right? Speaking about the, the difference between calling someone God and con calling someone just a person that, or something that you respect so much because it has given you everything you have, right? So we see this representation of, or these elements of, of Chachutique in many other representations other 
than in Chachutlique. So let's analyze them. In here, this is a fragment of Borgia codex, and we can see a representation of the essence of the maguey or the agave plant known as meyawal. And in here, we can see that meyawal also have this nose ornament, despite that it has the, the maguey on the, on the back, which is what it identifies as meyawal. It has also the precious stones in the skirt. So this obviously is extremely confusing for, for contemporary academia because academia thinks that all of these representations are just characters in a mythological pantheon. But nature is not a character. Nature is constantly interacting with all the forces. So sometimes you will see some things more concentrated with others, but in all of them, the elements will be constantly present. So this is not a character. It's a representation of what is within this essence of the Maguey. Now, in this other uh, fragment of the Borbonico Codex, we see a representation of Xochiquetzali, but also we see some elements of the potential or the concept known as Chantico, which is the warmth of the home. But guess what? This is not just necessarily giving like, oh, women are supposed to be at home. And no, because in this case, they are sitting this Chantico slash Xochiquetzali in a set, in a seat of a governor. So they're making Chantico a governor. And also they're giving them, giving a nose ornament that was only worn by the governors. What does this mean? This means that even the qualities of being in the government and govern needs to have these nourishing qualities. It's not to rule, it's to nourish your people, it's to learn what actually helps them, like the river helps the people. So can you summon those qualities? Can you be the river to your village in terms of social change and cleansing and bringing a lot of what they, they will need to work with, right? You are not necessarily uh, giving them and feeding them. You are just bringing all of the resources that they have to work with, but you are being nourishing at the same time. So that's one of them. And then another one, which is also sitting on a chair of a governor, is this other representation of another Chalchutique. But in this case, we see it uh, with the name on top, Tonacasiwa, which is the duality of another concept known as Tonacatecuhtli. So Tonacatecuhtli and Tonacasiwa, they are known to be the main or the, the first forces that uh, compiles our organism. So Tonaca is our flesh. Uh, Tonacatecuhtli is that masculine essence that, that is our flesh. Tonacasiwa is our feminine essence that have, gathers our flesh. So the concept here is that we are all dual. We are not just one, we're constantly two. And because of that, we're constantly have Tonacasiwa and Tonacatecuhtli in our organism. In this case, we see only Tonacasiwa, but as you can see, the nose ornament is still there. And in this version of document, also the pattern of precious stones on the skirt combined with another concept known as Xochiquetzali. We can see here another Xochiquetzali taken from the Borgia Codex with the same ornaments. And then last but not least, we see a representation of Chantico on the Borgia Codex as a nourishing essence. So you can even see that the breastfeeding or um, capabilities there, which represents nourishment, protection. And you can see that the nose attire, the nose ornament is there, again, as a governor. So what this means is that a lot of the qualities of the turquoise and the nose ornament of the turquoise that only governors will wear require for them to learn the concepts of nourishing like the water. And that in most of these representations, although they are not necessarily categorized as chalchutlique, there is chalchutlique implied. So the essence of water is the mother of everything. And because of that, whenever you see anything that nourishes and nourishes us, you will see the essence of the Chalchutlique concept in it. As you can see here. So you can see the mother that is moving by the lunar forces and in the back also gathering and unifying human beings in the constant development of their own creativity flowing with a skirt of water. Great. 
So uh, just in case you're wondering about the sources, here is a little list of the sources that I took. Again, these uh, compile a lot of books, although not written books in, in, in languages that people read nowadays, but languages that people doesn't really know how to read anymore. And because of that, we're also opening a class of how to read these, these documents. So soon to, soon to come to our mighty networks, <laughs> little commercial there, sorry. Uh, but yeah, this is our sources, just in case you want to check. Lasso Kamati, eh, eh, Lasso Kamati, everybody. And Brenny was saying that she wanted to have a few minutes with, of worth of questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Tlaso Kamati, maestro, uh, amazing as always. Thank you so much. Uh, just want to open it up to folks to ask a question. Uh, and you could just also give it up for the, the maestro with a little emoticon. I'm over here <laughs> clapping it up. Uh, my son is always coming through, so coming through with the knowledge. Um, don't be shy. Ask a question. We only have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Thank you so much um, for that. There were some like very interesting little points that you brought up um, that I just want to acknowledge. For us, like this concept of the sewage system as a returning of water. And like, I think the way in which we think about sewage and the system of filtration is never one that comes from a space of gratitude of, of like, oh, we're returning this water. Or how can we do it in a way that is clean and, and in accordance with um, the ecologies around us? Um, so I just really appreciated that. and. The other thing was when you were talking about how these communities not only respected water, but took it to the point where they had this very active um, interaction with the water, where they had a lot of agency in how the rain or the water would come to them or would, would be placed around them. I feel like extends, expands to the point that you spoke a lot about, which is how we actually have that agency and that interaction with the water within us, within the water that we are, um, thinking about the advices that you brought up um, of, of being like water. And I think a lot of people forget how much agency they have in the quality of the water within them and, the, and, and how that kind of shows up. And I was wondering if you had right now in your life um, active prayers or rituals or practices in which you kind of return to that agency and that acknowledgement. Yes, there, there is. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing beautiful thoughts. Uh, there is some uh, little focus of attention. People call them uh, meditations that you can practice with water. And one of them, the most important of them is uh, a mental practice with it. Sometimes, and as you said, we are mainly the, the, the construction of ourselves as an organism is mainly depending on water. And there is only like a few other percentages of hydrogen and carbon and other things. And, and yet, that makes so much pollution sometimes into that water for that amount of time that we are alive. Sometimes that, those, those memories and those thoughts make that water so unhappy and so stagnant and, and so polluted and toxic, right? Because that's, an, that's another part of the teachings of the water that it, based on, on, the, on the study of Chalchut Liquid that your thoughts and your emotions are like water and like stones, both. You have to polish your thoughts and your emotions. Like if they will be precious stones, some of them are, some of them are not. And soon you should be able to recognize them, right? But as any other artisan, you will find those thoughts and those emotions in the raw. And sometimes you get these ideas and, and you don't really know where they are going and you don't really know what they really mean, but it is your responsibility as, a, as an artisan of thoughts and, and emotions 
to start knowing what's the quality of that stone, right? And then you start little, little by little chipping away parts of it. And then you recognize, oh, no, there is something precious underneath this. I should dedicate more time. And then you start crafting and crafting and crafting. And depending on what the, the actual stone is telling you it can become, you just help it to become what it was supposed to become from the very beginning, right? Just, just, you're just developing its, its shape. And then later on, it comes the more, the most mm, time consuming and also sensitive work, which is to polish a stone. To polish a stone is extremely difficult and it takes a lot of patience and, and, and time. But the same thing is for polishing your thoughts and your emotions. It's, it's, it's the same exact worth it because when you are done polishing those thoughts and those emotions and then you finally offer them as others, they will take them as precious treasures, right? Many times. Instead of sometimes people, it's not really done with them. You know, they just recognize, oh, there might be something, there might be, and then they're just soon enough just throwing their stones at others, right? Like, I'm trying to help you and give you an advice, you know, take it. But who can actually appreciate stones that are just thrown like that, right? And even because, even when you need to have serious and strong conversations, there needs to be a way in which you can polish them so that when you present them, people, one, can't deny it, their beauty and two they accept them willingly and say like oh well it's heavy but it's beautiful <laughs> thank you um so one of the concentrations of the meditations is that to acknowledge what thoughts and emotions you might have still undeveloped there and which ones you need to chip away little by little what do, what do they need to become another one that it also comes to mind is these with the water this is something we do sometimes in some breathing exercises where we just serve a little cup of water. You know, you can serve like a transparent cup of water or not transparent cup of water, but just feeling the freshness of water in your hands definitely does an effect. So when you have that within yourself, close to either your heart, close to either any of the organs that you might feel a little bit stagnant in, and just focus that water calls for water. That's the thought that we actually focus in water calls for water. And so whenever you see two drops together, they just become one drop. So water usually binds really easily. And that's also why it's used to, to mix a lot of the things, right? Because water allows things to just mix naturally and expand. Now imagine that you have that within yourself and imagine that you have it in that little re recipient. So in this case, it's more for you to allow thoughts and emotions to flow, not so much to polish, but to flow and to filter them. So uh, uh, many times people think that only by flowing, your thoughts will be clear. And that's not true. You need to filter your thoughts. As we were speaking in the beginning, the only thing that clears water is filtration. And the stronger, the, the more layers you actually expose that filtration on the water, the more clear the water will become after that, the, the more impurities will leave behind. So imagine your memory and the past, um, events being layers of a filter now imagine that you just become who you are right now but you can actually filter your thoughts if you expose them backwards and leave in each one of those layers what it belongs to that layer right so when did all this start? when did i start to be mad when did i start to be uh, sad when did i you know and then just start to like filter filter we call that analysis right uh, but in, in in ancient times it's just filter your own water so, and you can do it with a cup of water, with a glass of water. And those are easy ways to, to do that. Thank you. Thank that you. Amazing. That was incredible. Thank you. One more question. Last question. Mucha gente penosa. ¿Verdad, maestro? No, les digo. Come on, ask a question. One more question. Like they said, I have a question. When when are we when are we gonna finish? <laughs> That's my question. No, 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 I'm just kidding. I, I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> Sorry for being so transparent. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you for the beautiful presentation. I'm wondering in all your learnings and the ways that you have shared this information with so many people, what has been the most surprising aspect um, for you in your journey? in your journey of learning and in your journey of um, connecting to this rich, uh, this, this rich information and history. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. A great question. <laughs> A very complex, complex question, but great nevertheless. Um, well, I was born in this and I really can't, my, my father taught me my first things. And then later on, I was blessed enough to be connected to my master who became my, my adopted, uh, my adopted uh, father later on in the path. So I have never really been away from any of these. But when I started to share it, when, when I was given this heavy task of, of sharing, because believe me, it's not always really nice. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do it even if you want or not, you know, and you have to do it. So the, the first thing that I had, it was this cultural shock. And this is probably something that is not a, not a surprise for many people. When I first started to share within the first probably one, two years that I started to share, I was 20 and I turned 21, 20 to 21. Um, I was connected to some people that took me to give lectures in different parts of Europe and other parts of the Mediterranean. And that was the very first time I actually left Mexico. I have never left Mexico. And in my idea, these was only interesting to Mexicans. I was like, what? People over, is there Mexicans over there that wants to know this? Like, no, no, there's, there are Europeans. I was like, what? They, they really interested in all of this? And since they invited me, I was like, sure, if you invite me, I'll go, you know? So I went there and it was a huge cultural shock to see people of blue eyes and blonde hair dancing and sweating with all passion that I have never seen before. Not even in Mexico City, I've seen such a commitment and, and that for me was shocking. That for me was like, what am I experiencing? What, what is this? But you know what? That was one of the most transformative experiences I have had because then I realized this is not about nationality. This is about human beings. And this is about the human condition. And every single human being can benefit from such, such, uh, such teaching. So I started to reframe a lot of the things that I was speaking about and instead of saying like our people i was like an ancestral people of anahuac you know because it might not be you speaking of let's say people from from vienna right uh, uh, hungarians and slovakians and and people in cyprus that i taught i was like i cannot really say our ancestors right because they are not your ancestors so then i i was like how can i actually give you still the essence right the water right how can i pass these this water that I have in a container of clay that I was born with into your container of, no say, I don't know, a crystal or your container, but still say, this is water. You can drink it, right? Um, so I think that was, that, that could have been, you know, that, that transformative thing. And then when I came here, I was really glad to see that there is a lot of people that has migrated from, from Mexico and other places, and they are in such a need of reconnection. So this is, here's a different shock. Here's the shock of like people being very desperate to, to reconnect. And there is a huge need. And unfortunately, there is a lot of people that take advantage of that and say like, oh, sure, I'll reconnect you, you know, just follow me and be in my group and be my, my follower and whatever, you know, and there you go. Holds our form. And then all of these uh, unhealthy, uh, you know, interactions are formed. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, definitely has impacted me so if europe and the us mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much thank you thank you maestro gracias maestro Tlazo kamati i want to just thank you for your time for being here uh, give it up for maestro one more time with the emoticons <laughs> with little fingers the spirit fingers i'm gonna put some sparkles um maestro very thankful to you um Muchas gracias. I'm going to be not be in class today because I have this stuff, pero I disculpe la, la falta hoy. No voy a llegar. No, there is no class today. Ah, okay. No, I thought no we class had class. Mm -hmm. Okay, no. okay. Este, yeah. Thank you, maestro. Eh, That's okay, muchas gracias. Please uh, support maestro's work. Um, you can uh, follow their work. Here I shared it on the chat. Um, and it's uh, on I, Instagram, you can find uh, Maestro and their, uh, his duality, uh, Maestro Spawatzin on Machia Toltecat, um, and find out more about the classes that they're going to be offering starting very soon. 
uh, in the coming weeks after the 12th. So uh, please make sure that you that you look at that. If this is something that is calling you that you want to uh, deepen um, your knowledge in, please uh, please uh, go there to their Instagram. Uh, thank you so much, Maestro. I want to just say to everybody that's here that is part of CCA, um, we have more events happening today. Uh, three uh, aunties, three elders are going to be uh, teaching the classes. The workshop happening from three to six is about tule weaving, so very connected to what Maestro was sharing today. Um, Diana Almendaris is going to be teaching us how to weave with tule, so you can still register for that. After that, from seven to eight, we have uh, Bobby Cespedes, Ia Bobby Cespedes, uh, who's going to be doing songs from the uh, Lukumi tradition for Yemaya, for the mother of mothers, the ocean. And then the keynote is happening today with Maestra Celia Herrera Rodriguez talking about communal responsibility. Uh, you can look at the events for tomorrow and then the events on Friday. Um, there's uh, workshops happening um, both days, so I hope you can check the link there. Thank you so much. Uh, muchas gracias, Maestro. Thank you. Eh, Thank puro you rock you. and roll. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. <laughs> gracias, <laughs> Thank Maestro. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.